course, finding the right cottage is the most important thing. Oh, yes, we were very lucky. Did someone put you on to it? No, no, came across it purely by chance. Oh, how sickening. We were out for a drive one Sunday afternoon, that's all. Park the car, it's well over a mile from here, you know. Near yeah. the trees, you can't hear us. I know how far it is, my dear fellow. Your primitive trackway did wicked things to my suspension. Oh, well, we had to have that built, you see. Well, you can tell your road builder from me that it might do well for jeeps in Ghana or Mali or some such god benighted hole, but for the home <laughs> counties it leaves a lot to be desired. Anyway, it was a beautiful evening, so we decided to go for a walk. We followed a footpath across the fields, then we saw the cottage, half hidden in the trees. Mm. We'd always said that if we ever did manage to get a weekend cottage in the country, we'd make damn sure it really was in the country, not 20 yards from a main road. It's getting harder and harder. All the decent ones get snapped up in no time. Oh, it wasn't much more than a ruin, really. But we like the area. It's reasonably close to London, and anyway, Rachel fell in love with this house. Rachel, it's Lovely, really it is. I do envy you. It's funny about houses, isn't it? You know, how a house sort of welcomes or repels you as, as soon as you open the door. <laughs> We've been looking for years on and off, but Dan seems to think that beautifully decorated cottages just sit there in idyllic surroundings waiting for him to take out his checkbook. Don't you, darling? Uh, I felt it the very first time he came inside, almost as though something was saying, you're welcome here. <laughs> we had a hell of a job finding out who owned it. Took my solicitor the best part of six months, and then it was the land, not the building. Well, whoever owned it, farm labourers must have lived here all right back into the 18th century. Earlier than that? That's what my father said. Oh. Ten generations of men who lived on bread and cheese, and now us. He sees it as symbolic. Of what? Oh, he didn't go into details. No, they never do. Well, I suppose you got it for about fifty pounds, did you? Oh, a bit more than that. Not uh, too much more, though. It's absolutely <laughs> typical, you know. These things never happened to me. If I'd bought it, it would have turned out to be a medieval pigsty built on a bog. <laughs> <laughs> I think you'd better have a drink. Oh, I thought you were never going to ask. Did you have the kitchen built on? Hmm? There was a sort of shed thing, but we had to rebuild it almost completely, and the loo and the bathroom. Oh, well, if you're going to live in the country, even at weekends, you must provide for the creature comforts. I can't bear those dreadful people who leave civilized lives in offices and suburbs all week and then go back to nature and live like cavemen at the weekend <laughs> they deposit their dung in piles under your bedroom window and when they give you a cup of tea it's full of boiled newts <laughs> don't worry we're very civilized here i should have asked you first margaret but dan was desperate what have you have? Yeah, what have you got? Everything. They've got everything. Campari? With soda. Please. They've even got stereo in the bedroom. And you'll have a sherry? Yes, please. A small one. <laughs> I hate to think how much it must have cost you. So do I. There was so much that had to be done, you see. There didn't seem much point in half measures. A mortgage to a quite lunatic extent. But it's worth it, I think. The only thing we can possibly do in the circumstances, Dan, is despise them for the shallowness of their bourgeois values. You're quite right. When you can't afford something, moral superiority is the next best thing. You're at the beginning of a very long <laughs> story there, Dan, so if I were you, I'd forget it. No, I'll <laughs> drop it, Rachel. It would depress me even more than it would Edmund, I'm sure. I've got some photos somewhere. How it was just before the builders moved in. Oh. Where are they, Rachel? Can you remember? Oh, spare us, Ed. Please, I don't think we could bear it. We'll find them after dinner. I warn you, Christmas with Dan is usually ghastly. You don't what? know what you've let yourselves in for. <laughs> Margaret, you're biased. He overeats like a pig at dinner, fills himself up with gallons of red wine, then <sighs> snores and groans his way through till Boxing Day. <laughs> it's a memorable experience. Red wine? That reminds me. Margaret, where's the bag? Oh, I think I put it down in the kitchen. Oh, right. What's up with Dan? He's brought a bottle of red wine. I do apologise. Oh, don't apologise. We've got a couple of bottles of Burgundy, but nothing special. <laughs> oh, with Dan, it'll be very special, I can assure you. Dan is a wine bore. Uh, bring the bag with you, darling. We've got a little present for you, if you don't mind. Ooh. <laughs> well, actually, we've got one for you, too. <laughs> Thank God for that. Now, this, my dears, is a truly magnificent bottle of Burgundy. I know nothing at all about wine, I'm afraid, Dan. Waste it on me. Well, you can take my word for it. It's fantastic. I get it from a little place I know just near Covent Garden. The chap's a friend of mine, and he usually all manages right, darling, to rustle that'll stuff. do. It's a bottle of wine, that's all. We'll drink it, and it'll taste nice, and it'll probably put us to sleep. <laughs> My wife is a barbarian. Where did you put the present, darling? By the tree. Oh, yes, of course. <laughs> Ah, it's a grotesque business Christmas, isn't it? It always strikes me every year. If you're going to start talking about the commercialization of spiritual values, Ed, I shall laugh out loud. Oh, just the changes it's gone through. 
a primitive ritual, then a Christian sacrament. What is it now? The great festival of the belly, and none the worse for that. Here we are. Oh, oh, now what's all this? This looks very exciting. <laughs> anyway, happy Christmas. I'm so glad you could come down. It was either that or enduring each other's company for 48 hours. So I think. <laughs> oh, a lovely print. 18th century, isn't it? Yes, an original. Yes, I can see. What's the house? Well, that's the point. It's the local hall, as it was in about 1760. It's not there at all now. Pulled down in the 20s. Thank you very much. It's beautiful. We saw it in a print shop in Charing Cross Road and <laughs> couldn't resist it. That's the life you see, all that elegance. Everybody ought to live like that. Peacocks on the terrace and all. On second thoughts, I suppose you two are having a pretty good try. Mm, we lack the peacocks. <laughs> <laughs> My husband, you see, beneath his progressive, nay, radical exterior, is the most hardened reactionary. Wait. His ideal lifestyle is the 18th century rentier. Not at all. <laughs> Nothing is too good for the people. That's my philosophy. Anyway, this is our little offering. Ah. Happy Christmas and <laughs> thanks for the invitation. What is it? Is it? Oh, something made of wood. Oh, a carving. Sorry if it's a bit primitive and violent. <laughs> a woman giving birth? A bit distorted. My friends who are mothers tell me it's not quite that bad. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's beautiful. Or indeed ugly, but I know what you mean. It's genuine, you know, none of your Herod's rubbish. Carved by a real live African out in the bush. Where did you get it? There's a shop just behind Knightsbridge, <laughs> specialises in genuine tribal stuff. They're, they're ritual objects, really, aren't they, these things? Well, fertility, I suppose, yes. Probably for rain. But don't they make them specially for the tourists? I'm huh? sure they do, but not this one. This was carved by someone sitting in front of a hut after a day in the fields. Probably in a time of drought or something like that. It's beautiful. Thanks a lot. It's the psychology that fascinates me. You want something to happen to the weather, so you make an object which symbolises your wishes. You use your imagination to create a fact. All artists do that. When, when you imagine a thing, it becomes true. Well, not only artists, either. Well, <laughs> if you'll excuse me now, it's time I was saying to the dinner, ah. if we're ever to eat. Oh, <laughs> good, I'm starving. Well, I'll give you a hand. What she really means is they'll have a good old gossip behind our backs. Oh. Got any dirt on you, has she? Well, not as far as I know, no more than usual. Nor me, as far as I know. Is it worth it, then, Dan, all this? Of huh? course it's worth it. Financially, you can't lose. And who'd live any other way than in maximum comfort if they had the chance? Oh, yes, I suppose so. Yeah, but what I really want to know yes. is what does your old dad make of it all? That's a bit of a sore point. Well, I thought it might be. That's why I asked. But we had him down for a weekend, rowed non-stop for 48 hours. I can't help admiring your old man. I must do an article about him one of these days. You want another sherry? Oh, yeah, yes, please. It'd have been nice, wouldn't it, if we could all keep our simple beliefs, regardless of the facts? Yeah. Cheers. Ah. Uh, what did he say? Ask me if I hadn't got anything better to do with my money, which is blood money anyway, as far as he's concerned, advertising, public relations, market research, any of the selling professions, all out. Get over there with the goats. I should have been here and put the whole lot on tape. The working class and its wealthy sons. Worth a page or two in the Statesman any day of the week. He fixed me with his branch meeting look and said, Eddie, my son, it's no way for a socialist to live. Did he indeed? So I told him, in that case, I'm not a socialist. What did he say to that? Nothing much. I think he was shattered. So was I. Oh, the blackmail that goes on between parents and children. And the other way round. After all, if one is forced to live in a bourgeois society against one's will, as it were, I don't see why one shouldn't enjoy its legitimate rewards. I think we should be concentrating on how to be socialists and rich. No, Dan, you can't escape the old man's logic. You can't think one way and live another. I've chosen to live like this, so I suppose the rest follows. Bad news for the Labour Party millionaires. They live with <laughs> their consciences, I live with mine. Politics are forbidden at Christmas. Yep. Don't let him tempt you, Edmund. He's only collecting material for an article. I've already told him that. Just time to finish the drinks. <laughs> well, we're both green with envy. No, 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 what is it? Uh, another affluent indulgence? Oh, that's my Christmas present from Edmund. Except that it arrived a bit too early. Uh, not 
new today, then? No, I've already been playing it for hours and hours. What, what is it, exactly? Really? Oh, oh, oh. Is there no end to my husband's ignorance? It's a harpsichord, oh. darling. An early 18th century piano. Oh, yes, I know. Sounds like a drawer full of old spoons. That's the way some people play it, it does, yes. It's an indulgence, really, but I love the sound. A piano seems out of place here. It is a beautiful instrument. Play us something. What, now? In the middle of getting the dinner? Why not? Something gentle and civilised to usher in the feast. You are pompous. How do I enjoy it? Play, madam, play. Ignore the interruption. <laughs> well, let me see. Oh, what a beautiful sound. Just right to the cottage. Small scale, intense. Lovely. <laughs> what is it? This music. Something in the, in the back of my mind. Darling? What was it? That, that, that piece, do you know? No, no. Never heard it before. No. Neither have I. <sighs> Sorry. I, I don't know where that came from at all. I can't think what it is or why I played it. <sighs> Funny. Something lodged in your memory from years ago. I suppose so. Oh, sorry to make such a fuss. <laughs> For a moment I was quite frightened. Don't know why. Frightened? Deja vu. What? Deja vu. That strange feeling of having said or done something before. Or when you recognise a place you're quite sure you've never been to. Happens to everyone. You can't beat him, can you? Always on hand with a superficial explanation. No, it's true. The wires get crossed in the mental computer and it comes up with the wrong answer. You shut up, dear man, or I shall begin to feel embarrassed. Well, I better go and get the dinner out. If you'll excuse me. Pour some drinks, darling, and mm. put the lights on. It's almost dark. Wasn't that interesting? I don't know, was it? Oh, yes. The slightest nudge of the irrational elbowing its way into our ordered lives. Oh, you're a journalist, you know. You're a journalist from your bootlaces to the centre of your tawdry little soul. Why the hell I should go to bed with you, I can't imagine. Now, what have I done to provoke such a brutal outburst? The irrational, indeed. Well, what else do you call it? It was something that happened to Rachel that she didn't understand. She's not really like that at all, usually. I mean, she doesn't go in form. Well, you know. Otherness. Not the world we live in, the world that lives in us. Oh, that's all rubbish, Dan. Just an easy way out for people like you who can't be bothered to think things through. All right, then what really happened to Rachel at the harpsichord? But she forgot the title of a piece of music. But why did it frighten her? That's right. We haven't a clue what went on in Rachel's mind there, except that something did and it caused fear. You won't find anyone who can give you a convincing explanation of it. But that doesn't mean it can't be explained, does it? Don't deprive him of his thrilling little mystery, Ed, or he'll have to fall back on his own intellect. No, I I'm sorry, my dears. There's masses and masses of evidence that the mind possesses other powers beyond the rational ones. What powers do you mean? Oh, transfer and survival, all kinds of things. Showbiz, darling, pure showbiz. Not at all. There are countless authenticated stories. For instance, of people being separated by thousands of miles, being aware of the death of someone close to them. If mind can be projected through space like that, why not through time? <laughs> Haven't you ever stood on a battlefield and felt the presence of the dead? It's just imagination. You see a bleak field and because you happen to know a lot of men died there, you people it with ghosts. There's more to it than that, Margaret, isn't there? It's amply proved, for instance, that the mind can have a positive physical effect. I mean, hysterical paralysis, things like that. But you're proving my point, not his. The whole point about hysterical reactions is that they do have rational explanations. The point is, my sweetheart, that reason alone can't be trusted. It can look at the facts and because of its own preconceptions, it can come up with the wrong answers. That may be true, but in it doesn't fact, mean... In fact, it's oh. particularly noticeable in your case, in spite of all this pretense of rationality. I've never known anyone colour facts to suit preconceptions quite so shamelessly as you do. Why is it that with you, Dan, sensible discussion always ends up with frivolous personal abuse? I lack 
intellectual fibre, that's all. Thank <laughs> God for it, too, or life would be unlivable. <laughs> oh, it's like being married to Coco the Clown. Ask what? him a sensible question, he pours whitewash down your trousers. Listen, do you remember that dreadful party game, Nelson's Eye? It always frightened me to death. No, I couldn't bear little girls' parties. I wouldn't have thought that was your scene at all. Very middle class. Oh, well, we rough children were occasionally pulled in to make up the numbers, you know. What's it all about? You're blindfolded, and then you have to touch certain objects and guess what they are. At the end, they plunge your finger into a raw egg and tell you you're poking it into Nelson's blind eye. Ugh. Still makes me shiver when I think of it. It's a perfect example of what I was saying. And while we're on the subject, I've just thought of an even better one. Sit still, darling, and close your eyes. What? What? Oh, what are you up to now? Are they closed? Yes. No, I don't think I trust you. A blindfold will be better. <gasps> Oh, what? Oh, Dan, what's going on? One of the uses of a neck scarf. Now, stay there for a moment. Oh. What's he doing? <laughs> I don't know. Oh, the trouble with Dan is he got to the age of 30 and then started going backwards. God help me when he's 15. <laughs> Eyes still closed? Yes. Right. Keep them closed. And Edmund, you say <laughs> nothing. Just watch. Dan, what are you doing? I have in my hand an open razor. What? An old-fashioned cutthroat razor. It's very, very sharp. <laughs> You'd never believe what some married people get up to. Quiet, concentrate. I'm coming very close to you. And with this open razor, I'm going to cut open your cheek. Oh, are you? Charming. I'm getting closer. The razor's wide open. It's so sharp, I daren't even feel the edge. It would lay open my finger at the slightest touch. So my husband's quite mad. They all concentrate. Make the most of the last few seconds before the pain. I'm very close now. The blade is about two inches from your cheek. Can you feel how near it is? Dan, what is this? I told you, with this razor, I'm going to cut your cheek open. <laughs> An ice tube melting, no damage done. <laughs> My God, that did frighten me. Point proved, I think. It was the coldness and then the, then the wetness on my cheek. You can kill a man with a drop of water on the back of his neck if you tell him it's a guillotine. What was all that noise? Oh, don't worry, darling. A little practical psychology yes. from Dan. My <sighs> husband frightening the life out of me. Quite normal. Party games, darling. No need to get alarmed. Well, dinner's ready now, so if you'd like to carry the turkey mm -hmm. through, Ed, ah. love, it will help me with the vegetables and things. Well, Dan, light the candles for me, would you? Oh, yes, I'm all for that kind of thing, Rachel. There's a certain ritual about eating I should be very loath to lose. And I admit it's difficult to feel very close to the great spirit, opening cans of lunch and meat and fruit salad in a kitchen full of washing up. But when it's turkey with all the trimmings, the candles are absolutely essential. Here we are, then. Oh, good God. That's not a turkey. It's an ostrich. Isn't it? Ah, um... <laughs> oh, please, darling. Um, mm. Would you like to sit here, Margaret? Dan? You here? Oh, you've gone much too far, Rachel. Really, you have. I warn you, I'm a terrible pig. I shan't leave any of this. <laughs> I've already made your excuses. My Dear, have you noticed the carving light mm. neatly on the dish? A little idea of the architect. You can't be a socialist with a spotlight over your carving dish hat. What's he doing for Christmas, the old man? Mark Lawless. We did ask him here, but the fact is, he'll be much better off there. He'll enjoy himself much more. Good God, I've forgotten the wine. You talk too much. That's why. They won't have had time to breathe. We're going to drink it, darling. Not strangle it. <laughs> really, Dan, I have a palate like sandpaper. It won't make any difference to me. Uh, does everyone eat everything? Oh, we can work on that principle, I think. <laughs> Cook's group. On the table somewhere. Well, oh. here we are then. Sprouts, potatoes, bread sauce, cranberry jelly. Oh, suddenly I'm very hungry. How are you doing, darling? Well, not too badly. Oh! oh. oh. Lights out. Oh, no. Well, the bulb must have gone. No, it is. It's all of them. The kitchen as oh, well. How about that for timing? <laughs> oh, must be a few. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> no, 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 don't fret, dear man. No <laughs> harm done. This is rather nice by candlelight. Well, dear, my dear fellow, we'll all wait for you, and I shall save you the first glass of wine. Oh, I'm sorry about this. Well, don't apologise, Rachel. Please. Just as we were about to eat. The whole thing is so beautifully prepared. A few seconds delay is only going to put a finer edge on our appetite. Would you mind carving down? No, oh, well, if Ed wouldn't mind her spotlights and that. Then we can begin as soon as he's changed the fuse. Well, you're not going to inflict the Master Carver Act on us, are you? No, no, I don't have any fetishes of that kind. I don't care if they tear it off in lumps. <laughs> oh, I see. Actually, the cottage looks rather nice, candlelit. Just the fire. It looks nice any old how, Rachel, when you live in the dump we live in. <laughs> oh, Christ. Wait a minute. 
We could never do it, you know, Margaret. Not even if we had the money. Stereo. We have a talent for creating shambles and discomfort wherever we go. Every house we live in ends up looking like a bourgeois refugee camp. <laughs> all dead. Magazines, dirty underclothes, and half full cups of last week's coffee. It's all horribly true. <gasps> Try the phone. We had a candlelit evening here a week ago. I played to Ed for an hour and then we read and sat talking. It was lovely. I bet. Oh, no, this is too much. Is everything all right? No, it isn't. What's wrong? Looks like we've got a disaster on our disaster? hands. Disaster? A bloody electrician. What is it, darling? What's wrong? Well, just about bloody everything. It's not the fuses. They're all okay. As far as I can see, we've lost all electric power throughout the house. There's no light, no heat, no cookers, central heating television a whole lot kaput oh god no need to panic you've all forgotten the obvious solution and what's that this is england remember <laughs> what happens every year as soon as it snows or one or two people put their cookers and heaters on at once a power cut correct a power cut either that or the government has decided to teach the unions a lesson <laughs> what better time to do it than at christmas oh i do hope you're right oh of course i'm right there'll be a big inquest in the papers and they'll go on about how our democracy is at stake and then forget about it three weeks later <laughs> no it can't be a power cut why not the phone's gone, too. That's nothing to do with the power. Oh, well, don't worry, darling. It doesn't matter. I haven't finished the pudding or the coffee. We've got enough food here to last a month. You wait till I see that bloody electrician. Six months it's been done, that's all, and you can imagine how much it costs. Darling, if the heating's gone as well... The fire will keep us warm, Rachel. Don't panic. I'm very sorry. I'm afraid this has spoiled everything. But not at all. The dinner's cooked to perfection. Well, there's gallons of wine and brandy and stuff, so we won't miss the coffee. Well, it's very kind of you to say so, but... Let's forget about all minor inconveniences and eat this fabulous meal. I think I'll get some candles out. Don't let the dinner spoil. Yes, I'll take a minute. I'd rather get it done now before we all start falling over each other. I'll help you. Ladies, finish the serving. <laughs> Any minute now, I shall begin to get the giggles. The sight of Dan trying to be helpful is almost more than I can bear. I suppose we could make coffee in a saucepan on the fire. Well, I wouldn't trust him with a candle. He'll burn the house down. <laughs> Society determines consciousness, Ed. That's what the Marxists say, but they've got it all wrong. Technology determines consciousness these days. Same thing. Put your two over there. During the last batch of power cuts, we spent whole evenings reading novels aloud to each other by oil lamp. Do you know anyone who wants a beautiful modern cottage, all mod cons, except that none of it works? Well, this is becoming a very moral tale. See how our civilization hangs by a thread. Uh, Throw a few switches and we're back in the dark ages. Voila! Genuine candlelight. Well, I don't understand it. What's that? If it were a power cut, the phone should be working. Uh, it's not conceivable that the phone and the electricity should have broken down simultaneously, surely. Of course it is. A large pylon could have fallen on a telegraph pole. You lack imagination, Edmund. That's your trouble. Now, come on, let's eat. Is everything all right, Well, you can see enough not to fall over the furniture now, at least. It's very good for us anyway, all this. Gets us into practice. What for? The great breakdown when it comes. This is the latest hobby horse. <laughs> what great breakdown? When all the machinery finally grinds to a halt and we all go back to the land like our forefathers and plough and dig and re-establish our spiritual kinship with the earth. Sounds ghastly. Oh, no, no, <laughs> it'll be jolly good. The non-technological society. They'll still have journalists, of course. Oh, <laughs> oh, don't be taken in, Ed. He heard a ten-minute radio programme on Ivan Ilyich, and now there's no stopping him. Well, it hasn't happened yet. I hope not. <laughs> so, let's speak now, shall we? We'll start the ball rolling with this bottle of wine. Mm -hmm. ah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> very, very nice. You try that for size, Edmund. Oh. Well, cheers, everybody. <laughs> mm -hmm. Darling, look what you've done to the table. Must have gone down the wrong hole. No. What's the matter? It's not wine. What do you mean it's not wine? Of course it is. It's blood. What? It's blood. It is, it's blood. Don't be silly. It is, it's blood. Taste it. I'll get a cloth. Well, we'll see. It's burgundy. Very good burgundy. I'll let you taste it. Mmm, mm, burgundy. Beautiful. Let me wipe you. And the cloth. 
I don't understand. Really, taste mine, really. I'm not joking here. <laughs> it must be going mad. It smells just the same. Look. Now, that's not blood, is it? Oh, it is. To me, it is salty. It's sticky. I mean it. Stop it, Ed. Stop it. What do you mean? Whatever sort of game you're playing, stop it. Rachel, it isn't a game. To me, it it's tastes... wine! Obviously, it's wine! Give it to me! It's wine. Oh, never mind, my dear fellow. I won't insult you by bringing my own wine the next time. Dan, I believe you when you say it's wine. But to me... Oh. No, no. It isn't possible, is it? Let's eat our dinner, shall we, before it finally gets cold. Yes, 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 that's a, that's a good idea. Sorry, darling, this is a very hot turkey. It's the meat. It's the meat, too. Madras style, and then some. Oh, <coughs> oh God. <laughs> Have you stuffed it with chilies and pepper seed? Don't, don't worry, Margaret. I, I recognize a practical joke when I see one. Oh. Vintage blood and a bird that tastes like acid. <laughs> oh, just an ordinary turkey. Oh. I cooked it just as usual. Oh, oh my God. I think you poisoned What's us. happening, Rachel? Dan! Oh, oh, it's burning me! Water. Drink. Drink oh. lots of water. Oh. God, this is happening. <laughs> I think we're all going to die. <coughs> I can't bear it. I must get out of here. Yeah. <sighs> oh. 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 It's going off. Oh, that's better. Oh, yes. Me too. Oh. Oh, thank God for that. Take deep breaths. That helps. Listen. Can you hear music? I can hear it. Yes, I can hear it too. It can't be. Where's it coming from? Rachel, upstairs. She's turned the radio on. She can't. It's a mains radio, not a battery. Listen to it. What? Don't you recognize it? No, would you? Wait a minute. It's the music Rachel plays. That's right. Where's it coming from? The air? Where do the pains come from? With me, it's almost completely gone. So suddenly. Yes. With me, too. It was very strong. How I imagined taking poison. Was, was it like that with you? Burning as I swallowed the meat. Mm. No, it's gone. So is the music. Listen. Nothing at all. Silence. Rachel's coming back downstairs. Darling? Did you hear it? Or am I going mad? We heard music. Rachel, are you all right? Upstairs, on our bed, there is the skeleton of a child. I presume it's a child. It's only about three feet long, and the head bones are rather fragile. What? That's why I asked if you heard the music. Of course, you don't believe me. But it wasn't just my eyes. I touched it too. Come with me, Dan, will you? For confirmation or support? Both. Music then? Yes. I hoped it was in my head. Did you recognize it? Yes. Did it come from the instrument? No, it didn't seem to come from anywhere. From the walls, almost. That means it's something to do with me. Why do you say that? The music came to me first. I played it before I knew it. I'm the one. I don't see why. We all heard it. I'm very frightened, Margaret. Are you? I was frightened by the pain. But I'm not frightened now. Interested, really. Mystified. I can feel something. 
I can't describe what it is, but it's something dreadful. Well, I've always been a skeptic. I don't see any good reason to change yet. You will. See, when you think about it, it's a bit like a sideshow at a fair. All those cheap tricks and stunts catch your imagination easily enough. But if you go round the back no, and see the wires and pulleys that make them work... this isn't like that, believe me. It's a black hole beginning to open inside me. I can't control it. Well, I don't feel at all like that, and it's no use pretending that I do. Whatever it is, I'll be convinced when I understand it, not before. Rachel? Yes? Rachel, there's nothing in the bedroom. Nothing? Nothing at all. Everything's just as usual. There's been nothing on the bedspread. It's quite smooth. We we'll even put our hands on it, to be sure. My eyes saw it, and my hands touched it. It still had some milk teeth, with the new ones growing underneath. What's going on, Dad? Margaret? Something very strange. I feel quite all right now, though. Yes, so do I. Not hungry anymore. No. No trace of the pain? No, none. It went. <laughs> Suddenly. Yes, that happened to all of us. But none of us tasted blood except Edmund. No. And now this upstairs. I didn't imagine it. I looked for quite a long time, and then I touched it to make sure. It was a child's skeleton, about three feet long, with bits of clothing lying on the bedspread. I really did see no it. No one has suggested you didn't. Equally, though, we didn't see it. But we all felt or seen something, haven't we? Edmund, the blood, the rest of us, the food, the pain that just disappeared, and the music. And now, Rachel, this. And all of us, the house. What do you mean? We've all experienced the failure of all the machinery in the yeah, but house. But that's perfectly straightforward, simple mechanics. Is it? What are you implying? That the whole thing, the power failure included, is some kind of mass hallucination? Can you suggest anything better? The clocks are still dead, and so are the lights. If it's mass hysteria, something our four minds are creating between us... We're still under its spell. Nothing's been right since the lights went out. Before that, the music. Be some kind of rational explanation. I don't need any explanation. I just want it to stop. If it's a form of mass hysteria. How can what? it be? Look, we're four sane and mature people. We know what we're saying and doing. Do we, though? We think all the lights have failed, but maybe they're on all the time. Maybe they're blazing across the fields for miles. If you tasted blood and Rachel saw a dead child on the bed, that's just as possible. So that we've lost all distinction between what's really happening and what's imagination. Well, how else can you explain what's happened in the last 15 minutes? And these delusions have come from somewhere. And if, if not from our own minds, then where? Listen. If what you say is true, then what we need to do to reassert reality is to get out of here. And if necessary, separate. Break whatever mental chain is binding the four of us together. So I suggest we get into our cars and drive away to some nice crowded hotel where there's dancing and an MC and they're all playing silly and innocent Christmas games so that we dissipate whatever it is that's been deranging our perceptions here. I think that's a good idea. Yeah. What? The car was opposite this window, wasn't it? Quite close. Yes, why? I can't see it. I can't see any dark shapes where the hedges and trees are either, or even the grass under the window, but I can't see anything at all. Let me see. It's never absolutely dark, is it? There's no such thing as absolute darkness. There's light coming from this room, from the candles. It ought to reflect on the bonnet and the headlights. There's nothing. It's like a black curtain. Dan, give me a hammer the front door. Off. Right. Shoulder it with me. It's not going to open, is it? No, it's not. This window's the same as the bottom of the sea. We're caught in here. I know it. Something has got us trapped. Jan, look at the upstairs window. I'll try the back door. Okay. Don't worry. And there must be some rational explanation. No, there isn't. We're caught. Black as pitch, nothing at all. And the back door's the same as the front. So that's that. We stay and sit it out, whatever it is. Well, if it's some kind of mental force that's holding us here, let's see if it'll stand up to a hammer. I shall have a brandy. I hope. These windows are made of perfectly ordinary glass, nothing special, bulletproof or reinforced. Mm. 
The brandy's okay. So a hammer should do the trick. No. All I can say is that we must be a very strong-minded lot. Anyone else want a drink? We can't get out. Trying to see if it's possible to knock a house down from the inside and failing. Of course he's failing. In logic should have told him that without all that noise. It is a little bit low on logic at the moment. Panic might be a better word. Well, there's only for you to be so superior. You're as scared as he is. Oh, I'm sure we're all terrified. But we do take it rather differently, don't we? You stand there mouthing nonsense about logic, whereas I, being a fatalist, withdraw into a stoical calm. Edmund tries to smash his way out with a cold chisel and a hammer, and Rachel walks up and down. No, you talk superficially and incessantly and guzzle other people's brandy. It's a bit like the Titanic, isn't it? Ed runs screaming to the captain and pleads for a lifeboat, while I lean on the rail like an old card, dropping witticisms into the rising waves. Is that what you call them? <laughs> I wish he'd stop banging. It won't make any difference. Well, he's had a go at smashing out all the window frames, violently assaulted the chimney breast, tried to take all the drawers off their hinges, and hammered himself silly at the ceiling in a vain attempt to get out onto the roof. Any minute now, exhaustion should set in. And what will it take to shut you up? Oh, don't get scratchy, darling. Keep Spare your cool. Spare us, then, for five minutes, please. You, you don't mind me chattering on, do you, Rachel? Yes. There is something... Now the banging's stopped. What? Something. A noise. I can't quite hear it yet. C can you hear a noise? No. What sort of noise? I can hear Edmund coming downstairs. No, something else. Not that. It's no good. Nothing will budge. But if you can't break a window with a hammer, Ed, you certainly won't knock your way through a brick wall. How do you know? How do you know what I can do till I try it? <laughs> it's a reasonable inference. <laughs> to hell with reasonable inferences. If there's a way out of here, I'll find it. There isn't. There's just one other possibility. What's that? The fireplace. The old chimney's blocked, at least the full width of it is. But if I take the hood off, there's still probably enough room to get up the flue and out onto the roof. <laughs> I'll have to put the fire out. Oh, now, wait a minute. Look. What? It's the middle of the winter. It was bloody cold driving down here. Well, I can't take the hood off with the fire still alight. Ted, there's no electricity. The central heating's dead. If you put the fire out, we'll all freeze to death. It's the only way I haven't tried. Ted, it's pointless. If you can't hammer your way through glass or open unlocked doors, then whatever it is that's keeping us here will stop you getting up the chimney. Too. I'll believe that when I see it. I'll get a bucket of water. Oh, my God. This is ridiculous. It's your logic that's at fault, Margaret it not mine. When I get that hood off, it's clear to open sky. No glass, no woodwork, no locks. Straight out onto the roof. When you get the hood off. That's just a couple of screws. So were the hinges. You're wasting your time. I'm going to try it. It's the Empire Building Spirit, darling. We can't win. Be quiet! Everybody be quiet! What? The noise. I can just hear it. What noise? Can you hear a noise? No. Listen. It's very faint long way off. Yes. Thunder? No. Voices. Getting closer. Is it here or outside? Or in our heads. In all four heads at once. Why not? No. It's in here. Loud. Oh, loud. Is it a hurricane? Earthquake. Brickwork. What? Collapsing. Oh, bursting my head. window. What? It's broken. Didn't you hear? It is. It's broken. But the glass is on the floor, so it must have been broken from the outside. A stone? Or a bullet. Oh, good God, that's all we need. Somebody taking pot shots at us. It can't be a bullet or a stone. It's not starred at all. Its hammer must have cracked it. Yes, and the noise shook it out. That's right. So we can get out, can't we? Look, there's no glass there now. It's still pitch black. I can't feel any cold air, can you? No. But you can see it, can't you? It's broken. The glass is there, on the floor. So the blackness, that must be the night Come air. Come on then, Ed. The honour is yours. There's just room to get your hand through. Uh, I, I can't. What? 
there's something in the way. What? I don't know. Can you feel it? No, I can't feel anything, but I can't get my hand through, not an inch. Q-E-D. It isn't the night air. What? There's no moon. No? Nor any stars. No, it's still pitch black. Where are we then when there's no moon and the stars have gone out? We're here, in our cottage, where we've always been. Yes, we're in the cottage, but that isn't the night air. Well, then, what now, Ed? You're the commander of this little expedition. I don't know. How about putting the fire out and climbing up the chimney? Oh, for God's sake, what's the point of sneering? Do you want to stay in here? Not in the least, but I know when I'm beaten. Well, I'm not. Not by a long way. I admit I do have a rather low surrender threshold and am prone to total collapse the moment the pressure is on. But as a tactic, I can recommend it. It does have the virtue of leaving your opponent completely bemused by the ease of his victory. What opponent? Listen, supposing we try to work out what's likely to happen next, there may be some kind of... Supposing pattern. nothing does. What? Supposing nothing happens. Supposing that dreadful noise was the last of it and now we just sit here. After all, we've just had a very effective demonstration that we're not going to get out of here by any natural method. Something's bound to happen sooner or later. Why? Well, because... A totally unjustified assumption. Perhaps this is the end now. Just the four of us and time and silence. And the house. All right. Calm and rationally, let's work it all out. It's a waste of time. Why not just sit back and enjoy it? After all, in a sense, we're privileged. We're experiencing something that's probably unique. Inside the house, several extraordinary things have happened that we can't explain except by suggesting that we're all sharing the same hysterical delusion. I'm glad I married a rationalist. I always knew it would come in useful. But now, the house itself has become part of the delusion. We look through the windows and see nothing, and some inexplicable force keeps the doors closed. The same force keeps us inside even when a window is broken. The house itself. What do you think is beyond those walls, Dan? Do you think it's the two cars and a patch of grass with a track leading to the main road? Or, or, or is it something else? Just space, perhaps? If it's just space, your rationality is wearing a bit thin. What time does your watch say? 5.30, it's stop. Edmund? 5.30. Rachel? 5.30. So does mine. So does the electric clock. And I bet you every other clock in the house says 5.32. That must have been the time when the lights went out. So, everything stopped at 5.30. Or started. Everything? And I wonder what time it is now. For a rationalist, you're getting pretty fanciful. I'd prefer to wait and see before venturing into the realms of science fiction. It's the house, I'm sure. It all began when the house ceased functioning. The machinery, not the house. It may be that the house is functioning perfectly well. I think we've been selected. What do you mean? Chosen in some way, the four of us. What for? Something nice, I hope. No, I don't think so. Oh, well, we don't achieve anything by getting all intense and visionary about it, do we? I mean, what we need to do is to keep our eyes open and our minds at full stretch. Our antennae, you mean? You look at Rachel sitting there. She's got all her receivers working at full power. It's nothing to do with intellect, what's registering on her. You want to believe it, don't you? That's what it is. But I don't. I want to know. If it is something to do with the house, it can't be the house on its own, can it? And what's that supposed to mean? Personally, I've always thought that houses were places you lived in, not malevolent spirits. It must be us as well. Us and the house together. I certainly wouldn't enter into a conspiracy with one to lock myself inside it. Don't you see what I mean? The house is crucial. It must be. It's some coordination or coincidence between the four of us and this place. Oh, really, Ed? It's getting ridiculous, isn't it? I don't see why. If we don't stick to what has actually happened and what we know, if we start indulging personal fantasy... It isn't fantasy. Then we'll very soon lose whatever sense of reality we might have left. You yourself said it. The house itself has become part of our hysterical delusion. Yes, I know, Ed, I said that, but it was just a wild hypothesis, that's all. Does anybody take it at all seriously? All right, then. Hard facts. Did you have pains in your belly or not? Yes. I had pains in my belly. Did you hear the music? Yes, I heard music. And can you get out of here now? No, I can't get out. So, what are you going to do about it? I'm going to sit down here and drink brandy and wait till the morning. Morning? What makes you think it's going to get light out there? That isn't night outside the window. All the clocks have stopped, all the watches too. So what time is it, Dan? Can you tell me the time? No, I can't tell you the time. How long will it be till morning then? And how long has it been since all these things happened? Two hours or twenty minutes? Calm down, Ed. There's no need to get worked up. Oh, yes, there is. 
I'm going to get out of here some way or another. I'm not going to sit on my bum with a brandy in my hand and wait and see what happens. There's some loophole in the argument, something that will make it all clear. If you've got any better ideas, I'd like to hear them. No, Ed, we haven't got any better ideas. And I'll tell you another hard fact, too. What's that? If it is some combination of the house and ourselves, well... I've been here with Rachel dozens of times. We've had friends here for the weekend. But you, Dan and Margaret, you've not been here before. Well, that's charming of you, Ed. Are you trying to say that all this is our fault? Not your fault alone, no. Well, no, that's jolly decent of you. But you two are the new element in the situation. So it could be something about you and us together. And if we <laughs> want to get out here, I think we'd better sit down and examine ourselves and the situation between us rather honestly. Well, I was briefly a member of the Communist Party, Ed, when I was at college. It's probably that. Take it seriously, I, Dan, I please. I begin to take it seriously when you insist in turning the whole thing into a ridiculous joke. What do you want us to do? Sit down and drag out all our little peccadillos and misdemeanors till a sepulchral voice booms out, He's the one! And drags one of us down to hell like Don Giovanni? No, of course I don't mean that. Retribution went out a long time ago. If there's one thing we've learned this century, it's that the biggest crooks usually get away with I didn't say that. You know I didn't. Why must you turn everything into a joke? It's a hopeless task, Ed, even if it were feasible. The number of possibilities is enormous. No, no. It's a simple answer, I'm sure. Something logical we haven't spotted. Why be so arrogant as to assume an answer? It might be one of those stimulating mysteries like the Mary Celeste where no one will ever know. Dan, why must you be so infuriatingly flippant? After all, you were the one talking about all this earlier tonight. Was I? The submerged energy of the mind and powers beyond the rational. Games with ice cubes, darling. Oh, yes, all that. The world that lives in us in spite of us. That'll teach me to keep some control over my party conversation, won't it? That's what happened, you see. You've hit it, Dan. Have I? The world that lives in us. How would it be if that world in some way took over? If the inner world and the outer world changed places? Complete disaster. My day-to-day -day life is shambles enough. My inner life is total chaos. Mine's rather vicious. All the old scores I could pay off as part of the natural order of things. So that the ordinary external world becomes subservient to the world of dreams and desires. That's it, you see. It's us. We've done it. We've projected something in ourselves out of ourselves till it's become fact. You, you said exactly that, Margaret, about the African carving. In the imagination, desires become facts. What you want becomes real. In that case, what nasty imaginations we do have. Drinking blood and dead children, a very greasy and turbulent pool inside one of us. But which one? But you're not serious, are you? Of course I'm serious. Oh, forget it, Ed. It's nonsense. One of the biggest clichés of science fiction. No, I mean it. Look, Ed, I suggest you sit down quietly somewhere and let your imagination cool down a no, bit. No, 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 no. I can see it now. I can see through all this pretense. What pretense, Ed? You and Margaret, the game you're playing. What game? Are you playing a game, darling? <laughs> I'm not, as far as I know. Why are you both so resolutely determined not to be serious? Every time I get near to what's happening, you two try to head me off from the truth. <laughs> this is ridiculous. What truth? That it's you, of course. One of you two, or perhaps both of you. None of this has ever happened before. Neither of you has been here before. And all the time you try to laugh it off. Hey, don't be silly. I'm not being silly, I'm being very practical. I want to get out of here. Neither one of you is going to stop me. Ed, be quiet. What? Rachel. I thought she was asleep. Rachel, don't you see it? I see you making a fool of yourself. It must be them. Who else can it, it be? It could easily be me. It could be you. Me? How could it be me? Do I want us to stay here in this madhouse? You hated this house from the first. That's why you spent so much money on it. That's why we've almost crippled ourselves. Always the most modern and the most expensive of everything. It's like the whipping boy. A way of punishing yourself. That's not true, Rachel. I didn't see it at the beginning, but it became obvious after a while. You didn't want a cottage in the country. So you bought the most dilapidated one we could find. You felt uneasy about your own comfort, so you turned it into a show place. You felt ashamed of spending so much money, so you jumped at every opportunity of spending more. You're still not at ease here, so you keep inviting people down in the hope that they'll convince you. Don't say any more. 
Now your own guilt tells you it must be your fault. Punishment inflicted on all of us because of you. But you can't bear that, so you lose your temper and turn on your friends. No. It's very simple and rather sad to someone who loves you. Do you really think of me like that? I understand you. I know how real it is and how much it hurts. But I can't let you make a fool of yourself by savaging our friends. What can I say? <laughs> but there's no need to worry. No offence taken. Uh, we can truthfully say, I think, that we are all under some strain. We should leave one another alone. We've done nothing. What? It's not what we've done, what we are. What do you mean by that? What we are. I ought to apologise. And we'll take it as read. I suppose I knew I had all that inside me. I'm horrified it came out so viciously. Oh, for God's sake, don't be horrified. Self-flagellation is a very overrated pastime, particularly the mental kind. Some people are born with it, I think. Everyone thinks vicious thoughts about their friends. It's one of the things friends are for. Yeah, for instance, our jealousy, as you were showing us around this space, was so overwhelming, it must have been almost tangible. I felt bright green. No, don't. Here am I, I was thinking, having sold out every shred of integrity and talent years ago, and here's Ed, still fighting grim battles with his conscience. And he lives like this while I keep down in a kind of intellectual rout and house. <laughs> I feel a bit like Faust being told that Helen of Troy has gone back to her husband and all the kingdoms of the earth have become republics. <laughs> I envy you your ability to joke about it. Rachel? It's a mark of the useless intellect, Ed, the unemployed mind. It searches for the amusing angle on everything because it is nothing better to do. Rachel, are you all right? No, I don't think so. What? Look at her. What's the matter? She's very pale and soaking wet. I feel so hot. I can't breathe. All right. Darling, there, take deep breaths. I can't. I can't breathe. Oh, my God. Yeah, and get a glass of yeah, water. It's so hot. I think she's going to faint. Hold on, darling. There's a drink coming. Yeah, yeah. Don't Ow. pour it all over I her. I can't help it. She's gone. She's flat out. Richard, just a minute. No, no, it's no good. She's right out. She's gone completely limp. Is it a faint? It looked like a faint, hot and short of breath. Rachel? Oh, Rachel, that won't do. She's really out. Hang on. What? I've got some smelling salts in my bag. I didn't know you carried smelling salts. What a sweet old-fashioned thing to do. For all our friends, when you bore them into insensibility. Mmm, <laughs> oh. oh, she really is out. Smelling salts usually do the trick. If it is a faint, she should be coming round by now. It looks more like sleep. Her breathing is very quiet. Listen. Very audible. I can still feel it, though. Not deep, but regular. Do you think she's all right? I don't know. It's very odd. Oh, my God. I think she's dying. Dying? Breathing. It feels very faint now. Lay her down quickly. Lay her flat. <laughs> Rachel! Don't panic. Just get her as comfortable as possible. What earth can have happened to her? Could it be a heart attack? A stroke? I don't think so. She didn't say anything about pain, and her colour was all wrong for a heart attack. She's breathing perfectly well now. You get close and listen. It's faint, but perfectly regular. Oh, yes. So is her pulse, too. Feel. Oh, my God, what's happened to her? I don't think she's ill. Look at her. She's fast asleep, that's all. Flat out to the world. It must be a nervous reaction of some kind. She looks perfectly peaceful now. Except... What? None of these things are natural, are they? Well, I don't know about that. Oh, come on, Margaret. You've been tying your mind in knots trying to think of a rational way out when it gets clearer and clearer that there isn't one. And if it's not rational, what then? Then this is a part of it, too. Perhaps it's the beginning. The beginning of what? Which of us will feel short of breath next and then go unconscious all in a few seconds? Who will be the third one? And what will the last one do with three of us sleeping and only himself or herself awake. Oh, that's absurdly melodramatic. No, it isn't. And don't you feel a kind of terror closing in? Like ice building up all around us? Ed, you have a talent for histrionics that has lain dormant all these years. It's perfectly plain what has happened. 
Rachel, after a period of high nervous excitement, including a row with you, has fallen into a deep and refreshing sleep and jolly good luck to her. It ought to be perfectly possible to wake her up, then, by shaking her or shouting in her ear. No, no, I wouldn't do that. Why not? Uh, it's always bad to startle people from sleep like that. If it is sleep. Well, I think we're all becoming victims of Ed's obsessions. When I said that, you laughed at me. I don't mean supernaturally, Ed. Nothing could be more prosaic. Fathers and sons. All those inherited burdens we carry to the graveside, then pass on to our children with a wicked little smile. I don't know what you're talking about. I think you've got your old man shut up in a cupboard somewhere, and he's putting the evil eye on us till you let him out. Is it me, then? All this? Have I, have no, I done it? No, you haven't, my dear man, and that's the point. Margaret and myself, you see, being of the most crystalline and unclouded conscience, we tend to assume the best, not the worst. Which is why I suggest you stop lacerating yourself and just let things happen for a bit. Regard them with appreciation or amazement, but don't necessarily assume they're directed personally at you. And now I have a quite revolutionary suggestion to make. What? Let's all go to bed. Then when we wake up, it'll be Boxing Day morning and we can all have a huge breakfast because by then we'll be starving. Dan, that is a very good idea. It's like marital rows or worries about your career. When they happen in the middle of the night, ignore them because it all looks quite different in the morning. So, where shall we sleep? You can, if you like. I'll stay here with Rachel. Well, I certainly don't intend to sleep upstairs, Ed. Because of the room? What? Where Rachel saw the child. Oh, no, I've forgotten that. No, it'll be freezing cold up there without the central heating. It's getting cold enough down here. We'll make up a marital couch by the fire, shall we, darling? It'll be like returning to my earliest youth. I had my first meaningful experiences on hearth rugs. Not with me, you didn't. He was still at school. So was I, come to that. Where are the blankets, Ed? They're in the room, too. There's a built-in blanket cupboard opposite the bed. Well, if you don't mind me pinching a candle, I'll go up and get them. Shall I come with you? No, if I want any help, I'll call you. To carry the blankets, I mean. <laughs> ah, Margaret's as tough as old boots, you know. That's why I adore her. Rachel still asleep? Exactly the same. Strange, but very sensible in the circumstances. I wonder if she's dreaming. It'd have to be pretty exotic to cap this. You're right about me, Dan. And Rachel, of course. Right about what? The legacy I get from my father. Not only you. It's a bit much to be loaded with a Puritan conscience when you're not a Puritan. Oh, my dear man, half the population could say the same thing. They all proclaim their intellectual freedom and moral liberty. And just behind their shoulder comes this grim-faced chap with a black hat and white collar. Where's yours, then? In my case, he's shriveled. You need to preserve some moral sense or the poor bugger starves to death. I don't believe you. Look, don't deceive yourself into thinking that I'm very good-hearted under this glittering exterior. I tried to comfort myself with that thought till I was nearly thirty. I was preserving my real and worthwhile self to blossom in middle age. Now I'm on the verge of middle age, I find there's nothing left to blossom with. The bud has gone rotten, and the whole tree is dying from the root. That's just self-dramatization. Uh, maybe... But she knows me. All my evasions and self-deceptions. Even if I hide them from myself, I can't hide them from her. All this, for instance. It's wrong. I know that. All what? The house. Me. Us. Ah. I know what price the rest of the world pays for our comfort. And how many thin Africans it takes to make one overweight Englishman. And that knowledge is the beginning of damnation. Fruitless, Ed. Fruitless luxury. Luxury? You don't intend to do anything about it any more than anyone else does. Agonizing over it gives you the double satisfaction of feeling bad about it and feeling good about feeling bad, both at the same time. Yes, that's right too, I suppose. Of course it's right. We're all damn hands at these games with conscience our generation. We grew up with them. But I'm also good at my job. Very good at it. I make a lot of money and I'm capable of making a lot more. And why the hell shouldn't I? There are enough incapable people in the world, but I'm not one of them. I can cope. Now, now. What? Not content with being the big bad wolf. You want to be the ogre that eats children as well. Forget it. Have a drink. Yes. I think I will. The brandy is very reliable, smooth and strong and uncompromised, like me. Are you frightened, Dan? 
terrified, my dear. I'm keeping my plum, that's all. Yeah. Every now and then I get a great surge of feeling that everything must be all right. The doors are open and we imagined it all. <laughs> Standing here talking to you, it's very hard to believe any of it happened. Try the red wine. I no, I can't do that. <laughs> then we'd better assume everything did. What will happen to us? I don't choose to think about that. I'm a slave to experience, Ed, a creature of the present moment. It's the only way life can be made endurable. Otherwise, it consists of nothing but regrets over the past and apprehensions about the future. Who wants to live like that? No one. That's right. No one. When I won my scholarship, my dad said to me, Eddie, my son, your father was born and brought up in a slum street in the East End and he's wasted his life in dirty factories making other people rich. And now you're going to Oxford. Through you, son, and others like you, the working class will come to power. Yeah. Even at 18, I didn't know where to look. Yeah. Sounds like she made it. Hello, darling. All well? Yes, all well. How's Rachel? Just the same. Here, take these. My arms are breaking. Good God, your hands! What? They're freezing like ice! Yes, of course they are. It's cold up there. It was shaking or shaking like a leaf. All right, then I'm shaking. What happened? Nothing happened. I got cold. I think something did. All right. I was scared out of my wits. Are you satisfied? But, but nothing happened. I saw nothing. I touched nothing. Nothing happened. But you were scared. <sighs> That was my own fault, my imagination running riot, that's all. And why the hell can't we be adding machines, just get the facts and store them, and that's that? Why the hell do we have to dramatise everything? Tell me, darling. It was nothing. I was alone, in the dark. There were shadows and noises, and I was scared. Noises? What noises? Breathing. Breathing noises. It was me, obviously. I was listening to my own breathing, and it frightened me. Tell us what happened. I just went upstairs to get the blankets... The candle didn't throw much light, but I could see. I found the cupboard and I opened it. The bed was behind me. And then? I felt I wasn't alone. There was someone else, other people in the room, and that's when I heard the breathing coming from the bed behind me. What sort of breathing? Difficult. Laboured. It couldn't have been you, then? I turned round, and of course, there was nothing. I stood there and said to myself, All right, Margaret, this is fascinating. You're going to stare this one out, whatever it is. So I stood there with the blankets and the candle. But then... What? I had to leave. I had to get out of that room. Dear God, rather you than me. And it was my imagination, Dan. It was my imagination. What else could it be? I think that's a question we don't ask anymore. Uh, Look at Rachel. Oh, uh, God. She's asleep or awake. She's sitting up trying to say something. She's in agony. Oh, she's dreaming. She must be dreaming. Dreaming what, for heaven's sake, to make her look like that? Uh, hello. I must have fallen asleep. Rachel? Oh, I'm a bit dizzy. Do you feel all right? Of course I feel all right. Not awake yet. You fell asleep did very I, suddenly. Did I? I don't remember. Did you dream anything? No, I don't think so. How do you feel? Not ill or anything? No. What's wrong? Why do you keep asking me questions? I feel just as I felt before, except a bit colder. I have a blanket. Blanket? Oh, we thought we might go to sleep, too. It doesn't seem such a good idea now, though. Nothing's changed, has it? No, nothing's changed. No. It still feels the same. So what now? God knows. Perhaps we all go crazy. After all, what's happened? Rachel fell asleep on the sofa, and I got frightened in the dark. Is there any reason for panic? There were other things, if you remember. Yes, dear, I remember. <sighs> Shall we make up this bed, then? If you like. Not in front of the fire, though. That would be a little too antisocial, even yes. for us. Just a minute. Look. What? Look at her. Rachel, what are you doing? Doing? I'm not doing anything. Walking round the room like that, touching things. Oh, am I? I didn't notice. I still feel rather dizzy, actually. Sort of claustrophobic. Claustrophobic? Shut in. I don't know. Come. Come sit down. Mm. Oh, yes. It's a good thing we've got the fire. Mm. Oh. Shut in. She can say that again. Oh, that's better. That's nice. When you were asleep, 
did you feel anything? I mean, did, did anything happen? What can happen when you're asleep? And you didn't dream anything? I can never, never remember dreams. I'm fine now. Just this dizziness from waking up. Oh. So there. She doesn't remember. Give in gracefully, darling. You can't expect to find a rational answer where none of the laws of reason apply. That's just an assumption on your part. <laughs> You've always been a great one for that. When you can't understand something, make an unjustified assumption and announce it as fact. Ah, that's one of the benefits of a university education. Two useful things I learned at college. Whatever you say is true, if you say it authoritatively enough. And don't worry if you haven't read the books everyone's talking about because they haven't read them either. Dan, we're in trouble, aren't we? It really hit me upstairs in the room. I have been to better Christmas parties, certainly. I've been to worse, too, now I come to think of it. Ah, shall I tell you one of the things I love about you? Tell me more than one. You're relentless. Most people know when to stop, but you just plough on. Is that a virtue? Tonight it is. Stop thinking about it. There's nothing you can do. I can't help it. When I die, I'd hate to be drugged into insensibility, however painful it is. I shall want to know. George Orwell said it's best to die in your boots. But he didn't. No. You feel better now? I wonder how long we'll have to wait. Wait? What for? I don't know, but I'm sure we're waiting for something. Do you feel responsible? In general, or today? Over all this. How can I when I don't know what it is? I don't. Ed sees the fate of the whole universe depending on whether or not he's saved, but I've always been convinced of my own innocence. <laughs> I hope you don't go to heaven. I shall miss you. Oh, you're not one of the goats, Dan. You've never done anything positive enough for hell. Oh, there I must disagree with you. I'm sure the cabinet posts in the Great Republic of the Damned are held by the Stalins and Hitlers, and that the murderers, liars and betrayers make a very efficient civil service. But your average goat, the rank and file of the underworld, I'm pretty sure that he's made up of shallow non-entities like me. Don't say that. People say that self-knowledge is the greatest virtue. But they always assume that when you make a thorough search of yourself, you're bound to come up with something interesting. Great wickedness or sanctity or talent. It takes real self-knowledge to recognize that you're just mediocre. That you don't feel strongly enough to get out of your chair about anything. The question is, is it my fault? Or have I been dumped in a world where there's nothing left for an honest man to feel strongly about? <laughs> ah, there's a shallow question for you. Give me time and I'll think of a suitably shallow answer. Do you feel deeply about me? I can't answer that. If you're not good, Dan, you can't just sit here doing nothing. You can't, Ed. I can perfectly easily. Now, wouldn't it be lovely if the lights just came on without any warning? Then we could all just sit down and eat our Christmas dinner. Incidentally, is anybody at all hungry? No. no. We ought to be by now, whatever time it is. I was starving just before we sat down. Why not try it again? What? The turkey. We've all been sitting here waiting for something to happen. Perhaps it's wearing off. Do you fancy a taste? Uh, not much, do you? Don't worry, my two heroes. I'm quite willing. But if I collapse groaning again, I shall expect you to pick me up. Margaret, are you sure? For experimental reasons, if no other. Ah. There. A rather succulent piece of breast. Well? Mm. Mm. Very nice. No pains? No pains at all. I'm not hungry enough to enjoy it, but it tastes good. Did we dream it all then? No, it, before it happened, this time it didn't. What does it mean? It might mean that whatever was happening isn't happening anymore. And that we can get out? But what are you waiting for? Do you want me to try all the doors and windows too? Come on, back door first. Margaret. What? Come here. Come here. What, what's the matter? I don't know what's happening to me. At one moment I feel myself and then... What? I can't say what it is, but it's something other. I feel it in my body. Something's coming. What do you mean, something coming? Something's coming here. All right, then. Let's try upstairs. I don't think so, Edmund. It frightens me. I can't control it. Listen, Rachel, when you woke up, what happened? I felt dizzy. I had to get out of there. There was no room. No room? Oh, yes. Something's happening now, Margaret. 
Whatever it is, it's beginning. I'll tell you what happened, Rachel. You sat up on this sofa and you looked terrified. What was happening to you? What were you feeling or seeing? It was horrible. I couldn't stay in that room. I had to get out. What room? You were sitting here. Well, that's that then. Well, there's still the front door and the windows. The windows are just the same. Look, the black as whatever it is out there. No way out. No, my darling, no way out. Oh, God, there must be something we can do. Something's happening to Rachel. I don't know what it the is. The question is, do I care anymore? Wait a minute. I've just remembered something. What? The photos, the photos I took of the I house. Don't think I'm very interested in photos just now. If it's something to do with the house, where did I put them? No, don't look. Leave them alone. Two sets we took, as it it was before we started and as it is now. Photos of the house? Darling, where the hell are they? It's coming closer. I can feel it. It's almost here. Which door? Stan, help me. Then, two separate photos. What is it, Rachel? What's coming nearer? I can't explain. It's in my stomach. Tell me. Try to tell me. Here they are. Two packets of plates. What is it that's coming? Where is it coming from? Yes, it's here. Here in the house. What? Ah, those are the before ones. You see, that's how it was. The metal isn't the fat or rotted and overbroken. The choice has been made, and now it's beginning to work. What choice? What has been chosen? Us. The four of us. We have been chosen. Oh, my God. Look at this one. And this. These should be the modernized pictures. They're not. No. Dan, I didn't take these pictures. Even the landscape looks different. The trees are in different places. It's almost as if... And this one, look... That large house in the background, about a mile and a half from the cottage. That's the hall. Same as in the print you gave us. I thought you it said... It was pulled down in 1921. God, no, I don't want to. I don't want to. What, Rachel? Look, 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 that's the cottage. Yes, it? but different. There's someone at the window. It's a woman. A dark-haired woman with a shawl. Yes, a dark-haired woman with a thin face and a shawl. How does she know? Rachel! She's doing it again. Moving around the room. Touching things. Walls. Don't say anything. Just watch. First, I must describe my situation. The cottage is more than a hundred years old and needs repairing. When the rain is very heavy or goes on for a long time, the thatch leaks or becomes soggy and everything is damp for days. The walls are lath and plaster and badly decayed. The plaster has crumbled in some places and you can see daylight through the slats. I try to cover those places with sacking as I do the windows. There has been no glass in them for as long as I can remember. Where does she mean? Here, surely. How can she mean here? My own position is desperate. But I try to keep my mind clear as far as I can in my fevered condition, but the pain in my stomach is mostly very bad and sometimes reduces me to screaming and groans when I can do nothing but despair. For myself, I suppose I could bear it more easily, but when the children cry out and moan and beg me for food, I feel I will run mad with anger and bitterness. It brings murder into my heart, and if I could, and it would help them, I would willingly do it. But what can I do now? Nothing. I can do nothing at all. Dear God, she's in such pain. There's nothing we can do, just watch. Oh, no, there's nothing more to be done now. Nothing more now. Just the waiting and the pain. The children have cried themselves to sleep and we are all too weak to move anymore. I can only sit here talking to the walls and wondering how long it will be. What children? Just listen. Go on, Rachel. We can all hear. If I could write. I would put it all down in a book so that the whole world should know what they've done to us. But no one bothers to teach the poor. So even that comfort is denied me. But I have to speak. <laughs> <laughs>
I have to make it known, even if only to the bare wall. Who is it speaking? I don't know. Just listen. I, Sarah Jane Mulby, born a Christian, age 26, a married woman, but now a widow. I'm lying here on a straw mattress with my two children, Robert and Jane. There is a little water, but nothing to eat. We have none of us eaten for well over a week at least. I don't remember when. Here, in this house. Listen. My husband, Robert, was a hard-working man, not sparing himself when there was farm work or anything else to be done. And we were all happy till the bad times came. The people had to leave for the town, and many houses in the village stood empty. There was no trade and no work till bread became too dear to buy, and then there was none at all to be had. The squire told us that there was no more work, and we must spend for ourselves. And the parson told us to pray to God. We did pray. We prayed to him day and night, but the food got less and less, and my husband was in despair. He took to going out at night, and some nights he'd bring back a rabbit or a hen or even a lamb one time, and we managed managed to live for several months that way. But the gamekeepers got stricter. A man in the next village was hanged, and there was no more game to be had, with half the country living on it. A man came one night, a stranger with a book in his hand, and he talked to Robert till dawn. They spoke angrily and cried out so that I heard it and the children stirred in their sleep. Then the next night, Robert went out with the man and some others, and he didn't come back the next morning. And I heard that there were fires in the fields. The ricks were burning, and the squire's barn had been burned down, and that my Robert had been taken by the soldiers. Rachel, darling. No, you must let her finish. I went to the assizes. I saw my Robert in the dock with the other men, looking pale and ill. I was praying for transportation, but it was death. I cried out to the judge that we were all starving. And what were we expected to do without food? But the judge spoke grandly about property and rights. And I was dragged from the court. <laughs> I took the two children to see their father hanged. I told them to remember what was done to him so that they should grow up to avenge his death on all the wicked men responsible. But that will never happen now. A doctor told me it takes 20 minutes for a hanging man to die. I stood there all the time without taking my eyes off his poor face, giving him all my love to help him bear that terrible death. He moved a little at first, but gradually became still. But I waited over half an hour to be quite sure. None of us cried, not even the children. Barbarians, barbarians. That evening I tried to see the squire, but they chased me away and said my husband was a criminal. I crept round the side of the house, hoping to go in and tell the squire of my children's hunger and ask for his mercy. When I got to the window, I could see them at the table. The squire was there, and his brother, the parson, and his sons. There was a side of beef and several roast chickens and cakes and pies and bottles of red wine. <laughs> And in the corner, the squire's daughter was playing music, a sweet, melancholy tune, while my husband lay dead and my children were crying for food. And I thought this can never be forgiven.
No circumstances. No degree of self-interest, not even ignorance, can ever excuse this feasting and dancing while on the same planet in the same village people are starving. And I knew then that I was beaten. That where there was no conscience, there was no hope. That there was nothing to be done. That this wickedness and injustice was too great a monster for me to grapple with. I came home and closed the door. And since that day, no one has bothered to open it again to see who may be inside. Here she means. She means here. I used to believe in God. But this world is men's work. I recognize it by the bloodstains. If God still sees us, he sees us with despair. Like Pilate, he shakes his head and washes his hands, unable to save us. I know we will soon be dead now. The worst pain is over and my bodily weakness is almost comforting like the beginning of sleep i have no forgiveness for the selfishness and greed which has destroyed my family the hardest thing of my dying is to know that our murderers will go unpunished. Someone surely must pay for our unjust deaths and all the other deaths like ours, for I know we are not unique. If no ear can hear my accusations, nor no eye ever read them, let my words burn themselves into the fabric of these walls, so that brickwork and plaster and beams should remember the agony and injustice of those dying under this roof. How can this ground ever be easy while there is no atonement for crimes like these? The soil is bitter with my children's blood. I can't say any more. Just this cry against injustice from the dark centuries. Jane is dead now, and Robert is in a deep sleep from which he will never wake. I can't speak any more. I shall need all my breath to face this starvation that is slowly draining my life. While we sleep in our pauper's graves, let someone, somewhere, remember. Us. The chosen four. <gasps> Rachel! Is she all right? She's dead. No, she isn't. She's still breathing. Rachel, my darling, are you all right? We must put out all the candles. Why? Put out all the candles and go upstairs. Why upstairs, Rachel? Because she's there, lying on a straw mattress with her two children, where our bed used to be under the cracked walls and the leaking roof, with mice running between her feet. The children are stiff and still, with their fragile bones protruding, and their skin like paper. She's half sitting up against the wall. She wouldn't die on her back. Her eyes are open, and the expression on her face is not an expression of peace. Follow me. Shall we go? I don't think we have any choice. Hold my hand, Dan. I'm frightened. Don't be 
Frag. I told you we were privileged. Yes, and I understand it now. Now, I understand it. Her speaking at a UNESCO conference in Paris has called for a radical heart-searching on the part of the developed countries. It is well known, he said, that under the present circumstances, far from rectifying the situation, the rich countries are getting richer and the poor countries are getting poorer. How much longer are we prepared to let this situation continue, he asked the assembled delegates. Finally, News is just coming in of a bizarre Christmas tragedy. In a remote country cottage, four apparently healthy people in their late thirties have been found dead. An air of mystery surrounds the story at the moment, said a spokesman at Scotland Yard. But foul play is not suspected. The four bodies, when found, were in an extremely emaciated condition. And although the house was full of food and drink, and a sumptuous Christmas dinner was laid on the table, almost untouched, all four people appeared to have died of starvation. In The Exorcism, the part of Edmund was played by Kenneth Haig, Dan by Norman Rodway, Margaret by Sarah Kesselman, and Rachel by Susan Fleetwood. Music was by Herbert Chappell. The play was adapted for radio and directed by Don Taylor.